लेक्चर फोर मॉडल्स ऑफ डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड कंप्यूटेशन कॉजियलिटी एंड लॉजिकल टाइम प्रीफेस रिकैप ऑफ प्रीवियस लेक्चर इन द प्रीवियस लेक्चर वी हैव डिस्कस्ड अबाउट द लीडर इलेक्शन प्रॉब्लम इन द मैसेज पासिंग सिस्टम फॉर एरिंग टोपोलॉजी वी हैव ऑल्सो सीन डिफरेंट एल्गोरिज्म फॉर लीडर इलेक्शन प्रॉब्लम बाई टेकिंग डिफरेंट केसेस ऑफ ए टोपोलॉजी लाइक anonymous oblique non anonymous rings uniform oblique non uniform rings synchronous and asynchronous rings content of this lecture in this lecture we will discuss about the models of distributed computation causality and a general framework of logical clock in a distributed system also in the absence of global physical time in distributed system we present three systems of logical time namely scalar vector and matrix time to capture the causality between the events of a distributed system before we start i should mention that causality is the concept of causality is the uh, is the fundamental for the design of distributed uh, systems usually causality is tracked using physical time since you know that distributed system do not have a global physical time so there is a possibility to realize it using an approximation of it so logical clock is basically able to capture the fundamental monotonicity property associated with the causality of a distributed system so that's we are going to cover up in this part of the lecture models of distributed computation introduction distributed system consist of a set of processors that are connected by a communication network the communication network provides the facility of information exchange among the processors the processors do not share a common global memory and communicate solely by passing the messages over the communication network there is no physical global clock in the system to which the processes instantaneous access the communication medium may deliver the messages out of order messages may be lost garbled or duplicated due to the time out and retransmission processors may fail and communication link may go down so these are the uh, char uh, characteristics of the distributed systems in which we are going to discuss how to write down the applications and the program so about the distributed program definition distributed program is composed of a set of n asynchronous p1 to pn process execution and the message transfers are asynchronous without loss of generality we assume that each process is running on a different processor so by this way either we call it as process or a processor both are signifying the same thing here in this part of the discussion now channel let cij denote the channel from a process pi to process pj and let mij we denote the message sent by the process i to process j here we assume that the message transmission delay is finite but unpredictable models of distributed execution the execution of a process consists of a sequential execution of its actions the actions are atomic and the actions of a process are modeled as three different type of events namely the internal events message send event and message receive events let e uh, eix denote xth event at a process pi for a message m let send m and receive m denote the send and receive events respectively the occurrences of events change the state of the respective processes and the channel thus causing the transitions in the global system state an internal event changes the state of a process at which it occurs a send event or a receive event changes the state of a process that sends or receives the message and the state of a channel on which the message is sent the events at a process are linearly ordered by their order of occurrence the execution of a process i produces a sequence of events 
that is E 1, E 2 and so on E x of a particular process i which is uh, subscripted by i and is denoted by capital H i. So, capital H i is nothing but small h i and the, the sequence in which they are these events are occurring and that is denoted by a boundary relation which is shown as an arrow over here. A small h i is the set of events produced by p i and the boundary relation on these set of events denote the linear order of on these events. So, the relation which basically uh, linearly order them expresses the causal dependency among the events of p i. The send and receive events signify the flow of flow information between processes and establish causal dependency between uh, from sender process to the receiver process. The relation uh, which is denoted for the message uh, transmission that captures the causal dependency during the message exchange is defined as follows. For each message m that is exchanged between two processes, we have send m preceded by the receive m message. So, the relation which establishes between send and receive event denotes the causal dependency between the pair of corresponding send and event send and receive events. Now, the evolution of distributed execution is depicted by a space time diagram. The horizontal line in this space time diagram represents the progress of the process and the dot represents the, the event and a slant arrow indicates the message transfer between two processes. Since we have assumed that an event execution is atomic that is inducible and instantaneous, it is justified to denote it as a dot on the process line. In figure for a process P 1, the second event is the message send event, third event is the internal event and fourth event is the message receive event. And here you can see in this particular illustrative diagram that for a process P 1, the event E 2 will be the message send event, because it is beginning with the slanted arrow over here. The message 3 of a process 1 indicates the internal event and the event number 4 of a process 1 indicates the message receive event. Why? Because the slanted message arrow is heading towards this particular dots and dots are basically the, the, the events and they are atomic events. Now, one preliminary which we are going to basically use in the further discussion. So, let me brief about that, that is called partial order relation. So, the definition of a partial order relation goes like this, a boundary relation R on a set A is a partial order if and only if, if it is reflexive, antisymmetric and transitive. The ordered pair A and R is called poset or partially ordered set when R is a partial order. So, example here is if the relation less than or equal to on a set of integers i will form a partial order and the set i and the relation r is a poset relation. Another preliminary and definition of a total order relation, a boundary relation r on a set a is total order if and only if it is partial order and for any pair of elements a and b of a, a b pair in R or B a pair in R exist. That is every element is related with every element on one way or the other. Then it is basically if both the conditions are satisfied then it is called a total order. So, total order is also called a linear order. Example of total order is the less than or equal to relation on a set of integer is basically the total order. Now, with these two definitions we are going to define the causal precedence relation. The execution of a distributed application results in a set of distributed events produced by the processes. Let capital H be the union of all the events H i s denote the set of events executed in a distributed computation. Now, let us define a boundary relation which is shown as an arrow over here on this particular set H as follows that expresses causal 
dependencies between the events in a distributed execution. The causal precedence relation induces an irreflexive partial order on the events of a distributed computation that is denoted by capital H and uh, this is nothing but um, capital H is small h followed by an followed by a boundary relation that is a pair. So, this will be described as so let E i and E j. So, E i precedes E j this by implies that E i and E j they are related with this particular in by the event that is if i is equal to j and x is less than j that is called internal event or the events which are connected or related causally using by sending the message let us say e i of x preceded by e i of j using the relation which is established using the message exchange. So, this is a message sent, E i is a message sent and E j is message receive. So, this is a send and receive event or there is a transitive relation also establishes the precedence, causal precedence relation E i happened before E k and E k happened before E j. So, that indicates that E i has happened before E j. So, there are three kind of causal precedence relation which is which induces an irreflexive partial order on the set of events which are happening in a distributed system which is represented by capital H and that relation together will basically denote the irreflexive partial order in a distributed system. And this basically establishes the causal precedence relation. Note that the relation arrow or a, this binary relation is nothing but a Lampert's happened before relation for any two events E i and E j if they are connected by this relation E i is happened before E j then event E j is directly or transitively dependent on E i. Graphically it means that there exists a path consisting of a message arrows and process inline segments along increasing the time. Uh, on in the space time diagram that is starts at E i and ends at E j. So, for example, in the figure E 1 and E 3. So, E 1 has happened before E 3 and this basically this particular relation is basically you can see is established using a path and this particular path 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That means, this is resulting out of the 5 different events to establish this causal precedence relation of E 1 1 and E 3 3. The boundary relation or the causal precedence relation or happened before relation all 3 things are same denotes the flow of information in a distributed computation and E i has happened before E j dictates that all the information available at E i is potentially accessible at E j. So, here you can see that E 2 2 that E 2 6 has basically is preceded and has basically the information or accessing the information of all other events which are happened before the occurrence of E 2 6 in this particular diagram you can see. Now, then concurrent events for any two events E i and E j if E i has not happened before E j and E j also has not be happened before uh, E i then events E i and E j are said to be a concurrent event and they are denoted by a parallel bar. So, in the execution E 1 3 and E 3 3 they are basically the parallel why because E 1 3 has not happened before E 3 3 nor E 3 3 has happened before E 1 3. So, there is no causal precedence relation hence they are called concurrent event and represented using a vertical bars.
Now, the relation concurrent event which is shown by the vertical bar is non transitive that is E i and E j they are related with a concurrent event and E j and E k they are related with a concurrent event that does not imply that E i and E k they are related with a concurrent event. Now, for any two events E i and E j in a distributed system these three different relation holds either E i has happened before E j or E j has happened before E i or E i and E j they are concurrent event. Now, logical versus physical concurrency in a distributed computation two events are logically concurrent if they do not causally affect each other. Physical concurrency on the other hand has connotation that events occur at the same instant in the physical time. Note that the two or more events may be logically concurrent even though they do not occur at the same instance in the physical time. For example, in figure 4.1 events in the set E E 1 3 and E 2 4 and E 3 3 are logically concurrent, but they occurred at different instant in the physical time. However, note that if the processor speeds and the message delays had been different, the execution of these events could have very well coincided in the physical time. So, although they are logically concurrent, so although they are logically concurrent, but physical time is a different way of expressing it. So, here even if they incidentally get the same physical time or, or not does not makes any difference. So, both are basically representing the logical concurrent events. So, whether a set of logically concurrent event coincide in a physical time or in what order is the physical time they occur they occur does not change the outcome of the computation. Now, another model of a distributed computation that is the model for communication network briefly we are going to discuss this. So, there are several models of service provided by the communication network namely FIFO model, non FIFO model and causal ordering model. In FIFO model each channel acts as a first in first out message queue thus the message ordering is preserved by the channel itself. In the non FIFO model the channel acts like a set in which the sender adds the message and the receiver removes the message from it in a random order. And causal ordering model is based on Lampert's happened before relation a system that supports the causal ordering model satisfies the following condition causal order for any two message m i j and m k j which are going to the same destination if send of m i j is happened before send of m k j then receive of m i j causally related and happened before receive of m k j. This property ensures that causally related message such destined, destined to the same destination are delivered in an order that is consistent with their causality relation. So, causally ordered delivery of the messages implies FIFO message delivery. So, causal ordering model considerably implies or signifies the design of distributed algorithm because it provides inbuilt synchronization and is used in various applications. Causality and logical time the concept of causality the concept of causality between the events is fundamental to the design and analysis of parallel and distributed computing and operating system usually causality is tracked using physical time like we are doing in our daily life. For example, a queue for purchasing a ticket or basically a line of uh, people standing for uh, arrival of a bus and so on and so forth. So, they are all 
subtract using the physical time. So, whosoever has come first, come first means the causality of coming and joining the queue and that is basically is done or is being tracked using physical time. With this explanation, we are now going to see how we are going to use it causality in the distributed system. In distributed system, it is not possible to have a global physical time. It is possible to realize only approximation of it. As asynchronous distributed computation make progress in its parts, the logical time is sufficient to capture the fundamental monotonicity property associated with causality in a distributed system. So, meaning to say that though we do not have the global physical time, yet we are going to use an approximation of it because that is what only is required to capture the causality in a distributed systems by between the events. So, this lecture discusses three ways to implement the logical time, which is an approximation of a global physical time and which will capture the causality of events in the distributed system without having the common physical clock. So, there are three different ways to implement the logical time we are going to discuss in this part of the lecture they are the scalar time, vector time and matrix time. Now, causality among the events in a distributed system is a powerful concept in reasoning, analyzing and drawing inferences about the computation. The knowledge of causal precedence relation among the events of processes helps solve various problems in a distributed system such as when we see the distributed algorithm design for mutual exclusion, there you can use th there you can see that for fairness uh, we, we are going to use this particular time concept. Similarly, in a replicated database databases, this time concept is used to have a consistent updates. Similarly, in a deadlock detection correctly using for avoiding the phantoms and other problems, this particular time concept or causality concept we are going to use it. Similarly, the tracking of dependent events, knowledge about the progress of a computation and concurrency measures. So, you just see that causality is one of the important uh, means uh, concept in the design of distributed algorithm and the system that we are going to discuss in this course, in this lecture. Now, framework for a system of logical clocks. A system of logical clocks consists of a time domain T and a logical clock C. The elements of T form a partially ordered set over a relation which is shown as less than, but it is a relation less than is called happened before or a causal precedence relation. Intuitively, this relation is analogous to the earlier than relation provided by the physical time. So, now we are correlating the properties of a physical time using alternative concept that is called basically the logical time or a logical clocks. So, the logical clock C is a function that maps an event E in a distributed system to an element in a time domain T and that is denoted by C E and it is also called the time stamp of an event E and is denoted by this particular function. So, C is a function which will which will take the events out of the distributed events which is denoted by capital H and will basically map on to a time domain and this particular function will form a, a time stamp that is C of E of a particular event in a distributed system. Now, such that the following properties are satisfied. So, for any two events E i and E j and if E i is happened before E j or they are related with this particular relation, causal precedence relation, E i is happened before E j. This will imply that 
the time stamp of E i is less than the time stamp of E j. This monotonicity property is called the clock consistency condition. When T and C that is the time and the clock domain satisfies the following conditions that is for any two event E i and E j, E i is happened before E j this by implies that the time stamp of E i is less than time stamp of E j or you can also say that the time stamp of E i is less than time stamp of E j this implies that E i is happened before E j. If both ways this particular relation holds then this system of clock is called a strongly consistent system of clocks. So, we have seen the two condition one is a clock consistency condition the other is called strongly consistent condition of the clocks. Here only the implication will give the time stamp if the relations are related with the happened before then basically the time stamp is less than the time stamp of other events. And if it is a strongly consistent then it is a by implies that means if the time stamps are given by that we can infer whether the two events are happened before or not that we are going to see in more detail further. Now, implementing the logical clocks implementation of a logical clocks requires addressing two issues. First one is the data structure local to every process to represent the logical time and the protocol to update the data structure to ensure the consistency condition. So, each process P i maintains a data structure that allows the following two capabilities. The first one is called local logical clock and denoted by L c i that helps process P i measure its own progress or you can also say that this will ensure the progress of internal events. Now, second is about the protocol and it is basically called the, lo the logical global clock that is GC, GC of i. That is the representation of a process P i's local view of the logical global time typically L C i is a part of G C i. So, the protocol ensures that the processes logical clock and thus its view of the global time is managed consistently. The protocol consists of the following two rules. This rule governs R 1 rule governs how the local logical clock is updated by a process when it executes an event. R 2 rule this rule governs how a process updates its global logical clock to updates its view of the global time and a global progress. Now, the system of logical clocks differ in their representation of the logical time and also in the protocol to update the logical clocks. So, that was the general framework. Now, we are going to see the first type of logical time that is called the scalar time. This particular scalar time was proposed by the Lampert in 1978 as an attempt to totally order the events in a distributed system. Here the time domain is the set of non negative integers. The logical local clock of a process P i and its local view of a global time are squashed into one integer variable C i. Now, the rules of implementing the protocol goes like this the rule R 1 and R 2 to update the clocks are as follows R 1 rule before executing an event that is send receive or internal the process P i executes the following C i is equal to C i plus D where D is greater than 0. In general every time R 1 rule is executed D can have different values however, typically D is kept as 1 rule R 2. So, each message piggybacks the clock value of its sender at the sending time. Now, when a process P i receives a message with a time stamp C of message it executes the following action. So, there are three actions first action is this C of message is the time stamp which basically was piggybacked 
and received at the particular process and ci is basically the clock value internally so the maximum of this will be updated in ci value then it will execute the rule 1 and will deliver the message so the figure 4.2 shows evolution of the scalar time so let me explain through this particular scalar time now p1 the first event that is basically it has the clock c1 so using c1 the event was time stamp as 1 now event 2 was time stamped as 2 here for the process p1 now event 2 is a send of a message so this particular time stamp will be piggybacked on the message and it will when it will arrive over here so it will take the maximum of maximum of this particular event c2 which is 1 and c message that is 2 that becomes 2 and then it will apply the rule r1 rule r1 says that this c2 is equal to c2 plus d and d is equal to 1 so this becomes 3 so so 3 will be time stamped on this particular event which is will be the receive of a event receive of a message this particular scalar time follows following basic properties the first property is called consistency property a scalar clock satisfies the monotonicity property and hence the consistency property that is for any two event ei and ej if ei is happened before ej this will imply that the the, the time stamp of ei is less than the time stamp of ej so that means in our normal situation also if a event has happened before before the other event or if somebody is standing in the front of the queue the next person who comes afterwards his time will be more than the person who is standing in the front of the queue or who has arrived before him so using this concept also here you can basically uh, see that this particular uh, events happening and the time stamp of the clock will hold this, this particular relation that is less than relation now the next property which will be satisfied by the scalar time is called total ordering scalar clocks can be used to total order the events in a distributed system the main problem in total ordering events is that two or more events at different processes may have identical time stamp because these clocks at different processes that is nothing but the variable this non negative or integer variable will be incremented independently so for example in figure 4.2 third event of a process p1 and the second event of process 2 have identical scalar time stamp here how we are going to order these events then in that case or total order so to do the total ordering in this particular case where the scalar time is the same a tie breaking mechanism is needed to order such events a tie is broken as follows the process identifiers are linearly ordered and the tie among the events with the with identical scalar time stamp is broken on the basis of their process ids so meaning to say that if they have the same time stamp of x and time stamp of y but their ids of x and id of y will be used to order them in case the time stamp are same the lower the process ids in the ranking the higher the priority the time stamp of an event is denoted by a tuple t comma i where t is the time of occurrence and i is the identity of a process where it occurred that i have already explained so the total order relation denoted by this symbol total order relation on 
two events x and y with a time stamp h i and k j respectively is defined as follows. So, x and y they are related with a total order relation. This by implies that the time stamp of x that is h is less than k. That means, either x has happened before y by the time stamp or if their time stamps are same, then the i d of x that is nothing but an i is less than j and if that is happening then this will total order them. So, tie breaking and partial order will form the total ordering of event and this is same as the definition of a total order we have seen in the in the previous slides that is it follows the partial order and also a tie breaking mechanism in this way. Further properties are that you can use the scalar time for event counting. If the increment value d is always 1, the scalar time has the following interesting property that is if the event e has a time stamp h, then h minus 1 represents the minimum logical duration counted in the unit of events required before producing the event e. We call it as a height of event e. In other words, h minus 1 event have been produced sequentially before event e regardless of the process that produced these events. So, we can count how many events have happened before a particular event. For example, in the figure 5 events precede event b on the longest causal path ending at b. So, in, in this particular figure, you can see that the event b has uh, basically uh, to occur event B, five different events have been preceded before it and that is why this number 5. So, here in this particular example or illustration you can see that the event B which is having the time stamp 6. So, that means before that five different events have happened then only this particular event B is occurring. So, five events you can see this, this, this. Now, another property is no consistency property for a scalar time. So, the system of scalar clocks is not strongly consistent that is for any two events E and E i and E j, if we compare the clock values that does not indicate that does not imply that E i has happened before E j. For example, in figure 4.2, the third event of a process P 1 has a smaller scalar time stamp than the third event of process 2. However, the former did not happen before the latter. So, here in this particular example you can see that the smaller scalar time stamp does not mean that they basically hold the relation that is the happened before relation. Now, with this particular discussion of a scalar time which does not have the strong consistency property, we have a motivation to have another system of clocks or a time which should have the strong consistency property, because by looking at the time stamp if we can infer that the events have happened before or not. So, for those kind of applications we require another clock or another time. So, this is the motivation to study another time which is called the vector time. So, the system of vector clocks was developed independently by Fitch, Matten and Schumach. In the system of vector clocks, the time domain is represented by a set of n dimensional non negative integer vectors. So, each process p i maintains a vector, vector of size n, where v t of i is the local logical clock of p i and denotes the, lo the logical time progresses at p i or that is equivalent to the scalar time of i of p i. V t i of j represents the process p i's latest knowledge of the process p j's local time.
So, PI's latest knowledge of PJ's local time is basically stored in the ith indexed vector of a process i. Now, if Vti of jth index is equal to x, then process Pi knows that the local time at process Pj has progressed till x. The entire vector Vi, Vti constitutes Pi's view of the global logical time and is used to time stamp the events. Now, the process Pi used the following two rules to update its vector clock. The rule 1 for the vector clock says that before executing an event, process i updates its local logical time just like a scalar clock that is the vector of i is assigned to vector i plus d. So, the rule 2 of a vector clock says that each message m is piggy backed with the vector clock v t of a sender process at the sending time. On the receipt of such message m comma v t the process p i executes the following actions. The first action says that update is global logical time as follows. So, it will take So, it will take uh, its vector time and also the vector time which is basically piggybacked here in the message and the maximum of that will be updated. So, that means it will update the global logical time according to this particular formula and once having done that then it will execute R 1 and it will deliver the message. So, the time stamp of an event is the value of the vector clock of its process when the event is executed. Now, figure 4.3 shows an example of vector clock progress with the increment value d is equal to 1. Initially, a vector clock is all zeros initialized. So, the example of a vector clock you can see here in this space time diagram. So, in the vector indexed 1 it is same as the scalar clock you see that it is growing in a linear manner. Similarly, as far as for P 2 the second index of a vector time is growing linearly and similarly the third vector for P 3 is also growing linearly in the vector timing. And whenever there is a send of a message or whenever there is a message exchange these global views will be updated at the other end of a process. Now, comparing the vector time stamps, the following relations are defined to compute to compare the two vector time stamps V h and V k. So, these are the operations by which we can compare the time stamps and infer the causal precedence relation between these events. Now, if the time stamps V h and V k they are same, this by implies that for all values of x, V h of x is equal to V k of x. V h if it is less than or equal to V k, this by implies that for all values of x, V h of x is less than or equal to V k of x. V h of V h is strictly less than v k this by implies that v h is less than or equal to v k and there exists an x where v h of x is strictly less than v k of x v k of x v h and v k 
that is the vector time stamps they are concurrent this by implies that v h is not less than v k and also not v k is less than v h then they are concurrent events. So, these set of comparative relations are used to compare the time stamps of between two events and we can infer the causal precedence relation between these two events. So, if the process at which the event occurred is known the test to compare the two time stamp can be simplified as follows. So, if events x and y respectively occurred at processes p i and p j and are assigned time stamps v h and v k respectively then x has happened before y this by implies that v h of i is less than or equal to v k of i. So, this is a very important understanding or if let us say v h of i is less than or equal to v k of i then it will also indicate that x has happened before y. Similarly, x and y they are concurrent events if their vector time stamps are basically uh, if v h of i is greater than v k of i and v h of i is strictly less than v k of i then they are concurrent events. So, another property of a vector clock is isomorphism. So, if the events in a distributed system are time stamped using a system of vector clock we have the following properties. So, if the two events x and y have time stamp v h and v k respectively then x is happened before y this will be indicated using v h is less than v k. If x and y they are parallel that means their vector time stamp also are basically uncomparable. Thus, there is isom isomorphism between the set of partially ordered events produced by the distributed computation that is h and their vector time stamp. So, they are basically holding the isomorphism property. The vector time follows the strong consistency property. The system of vector clocks is strongly consistent thus by examining the vector time stamp of the two events we can determine if the events are causally related. However, Karen and Boast showed that the dimension of a vector clock cannot be less than n. n is the total number of processes in the distributed computation for this particular property to hold. This particular discussion we will see in the next class in more details. Now, another property of a vector clock is the event counting. When d is equal to 1 in rule 1 then ith component of the vector clock at a process i that is v t of i of i denotes the number of events that have been that have occurred at p i until that particular time. So, we can do the event counting just like we have seen in the scalar clock. So, if an event E has a time stamp V H, so V H of I indicates the number of events executed by P J that causally precede E. Clearly, if we take the summation of V H of J minus 1 represents the total number of events that causally precede E in the distributed computation. Conclusion In the distributed system, a set of processes they communicate by exchanging messages over the communication network. The distributed computation is spread geographically over the distributed processes. The processes do not share a common global memory or a common physical clock to which the process have instantaneous access. So, thus we have seen in this particular lecture how to overcome from this particular difficulties of this particular model which is called a distributed system. So, instead of having the physical clock we have seen that the logical clock which will give the uh, which will give which will capture the causal relations between different distributed events. So, in this lecture we have presented the idea of logical clock which is going to, which 
captures the causal relation between the event that was proposed by the Lampard in 1978 in an attempt to order the events in a distributed system. We have discussed two system of logical clock in this lecture namely the scalar and vector clocks to capture the causality between the events in a distributed computation holding the strong consistency property and clock consistency property. So, in the upcoming lectures we will discuss about the size of the vector clock matrix clock and the virtual time and a physical clock synchronization all these important aspects which is basically giving you the concept of causality in a distributed system which is the most fundamental in the design of distributed system. Thank you.